Investment bankers, you're not going to interest them until you reach a certain size. Because the way they're going to look at it, they're going to say, tell you what, I mean, if I'm trying to sell a $10 million company or a $50 or $75 million company, this is the same amount of work for me. But my fees, since they're generated mostly on a percentage, that's not going to be that great. So I'd rather focus my time on selling a $50 to $100 million company than selling a bunch of $10 million companies. Welcome to M&A Science, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com, subscribe to our free newsletter, where we share highlights from our interviews and invitations to events as we build the greatest community of forward-thinking M&A practitioners. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science. Joining me today is Frederick Labor. CEO and Managing Director at Redlands Farm Holding, a subsidiary of the Bolor Group. The Bolor Group is one of the 500 largest companies in the world listed on the Paris Stock Exchange under BOL. The group is a conglomerate that manages a number of financial assets, including plantations and financial investments. Today we're gonna talk about how to prepare a company for acquisition and ensure business continuity. Frederick, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. How was your weekend? It was good. Thanks for asking. I'm glad you come, came to hang out with me. I'm excited to learn from you. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background? Sure. Okay, so sure. You know, uh, I did a business school in Europe called HEC Paris. And like most often when you do that, you start working in consulting. So that's what I did for a couple of years in Paris. And then completely out of the blue came a job offer uh, to move to Martinique, to the French West Indies, and to work as a CFO of a food manufacturing company. So here I was, you know, a young guy, hasn't traveled much, and you get an offer to go live under the sun after uh, spending all of your life in Paris under the rain. So I picked it up, and uh, that's how I started in the food industry. And uh, what happened is that company uh, had some, let's say, leadership issues. So very rapidly, even though I joined as their CFO, uh, I was named the CEO of the company. I was very young at the time. I don't remember if I was 27 or 28. Uh, great how experience. Many, how big of a company was it? How many people? We had 125 people. Yeah, 125 okay, wow. employees. Okay. And, and, you know, there is a lot to say about that. I mean, because in retrospect, you know, you're coming of a pres prestigious business school. And sometimes I mean, people think you know it all, but you don't. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, if, I, if I was in that seat, would I give a company I own to a 28 year old, even though it's coming from Harvard or whatnot? I probably would not because, you know, you don't learn it all. I mean, uh, paper is one thing, life is another thing. Uh, books are one thing and experience is another thing. So, but anyway, I mean, I was lucky enough to, for it to happen to me. And uh, that's how I got in the food industry and I've never left it since then. I mean, and that was in 1986, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> so since then, uh, I have been in, food, in the food industry in different sectors. I mean, ranging from wholesale baking to dairy to snack manufacturing. Um, and more recently, uh, with that new endeavor I'm leading, uh, oil, uh, edible oil manufacturing. For cooking. Sorry. Cooking, cooking oils. Cooking oil, yeah, that's the way the supermarkets are calling it. I hate that because, I mean, you know, there is so much more you can do besides cooking with cooking oil. And a, a great oil, you, sure, you can use it for cooking, but it's a bit of a waste. I mean, you have to enjoy it, test it, experience it uh, as a dressing, as a dipping oil. And that's what we do. I mean, we are making a very unique product 
that actually tastes like something and that has great nutritional qualities. And that's what uh, consumes your time and effort. Interesting. That's a great, great way to think about it. M&A, you've done some M&A deals. Yeah, I have been on both sides of the aisle, uh, sometimes on the acquisition side, sometimes on the selling side. Uh, it happened to me five times in my life uh, under sometimes very different circumstances. Uh, it started in Martinique, uh, where one of our partners was trying to acquire a company in a sister island from Martinique called Guadeloupe. And uh, I helped him uh, doing that. Uh, you know, the, the, that person was, by the way, a fantastic entrepreneur, a, a gentleman called Mr. Neuhauser. The guy started uh, with a small bakery in a small town in the eastern part of France. And after 25 years, was actually the largest industrial baker in Europe. So that's telling you about uh, growth and, and, uh, and that was his life. But anyway, he was living for his company and, and that's all uh, that was interesting. Uh, but then, uh, with him, I had my first exposure to acquiring a company. Uh, and that's really the same person is the one who, who took me to the US. Uh, at some point, he acquired a company in the US and told me, would you like to move to the US? And that sounded like a very interesting opportunity. And that's what I did. And that was in 1990. I relocated from the French West Indies. Uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, a little change of scenery, much colder weather for sure. And uh, that was again a, a baking company. Uh, and here, uh, during that time, I was exposed to both buying and selling. Uh, we acquired a company located uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and that company became uh, our uh, plant for the West Coast. And that was, a, you know, one of the circumstances where probably you don't actually want to be on the seller side. Uh, that was a distressed company. Uh, they were in dire financial trouble, uh, had no negotiating leverage whatsoever, had nothing to sell uh, but trouble. And so, uh, you know, we scooped them for a song. I mean, literally buying out uh, a few tax debt that they had and we purchased the assets. Uh, we did the leases of the building they occupied, and here we, here you go. I mean, that's how we had a manufacturing plant in California. <laughs> uh, but definitely, you know, since we're going to talk about being on the selling side, uh, that's certainly not a situation you want to be in. I mean, having to sell your company because you're short on money. I, I wanted to talk to you more about the sell side because it's, I don't get that story too much. I don't, it's hard for me to find people that really want to talk through. And, and I don't know if it's mainly because they didn't have a great experience in their memories. They'd rather not revisit, but uh, that's where, when you were open to speaking about it, I said, let's, let's talk about it because that would be fun. And uh, maybe you can give me a little bit of, of an idea of what those scenarios were when you were on the sell side of the business. On the selling side. Sure. Uh, well, you know, the first opportunity I had to sell a company was that company in Boston. Uh, I, I was the CEO of it. And that company experienced a fantastic growth, I mean, during a few years, uh, meaning when I joined that business, it was doing at the time, and remember, it's in 1994. Uh, so that company, when I joined them in 1990, was doing just a little over $2 million of sales. And in 1994, we were doing over $45 million. And uh, we went from one manufacturing plant in Boston to five manufacturing plants uh, all over the country. We had one in Phoenix, one in Miami, two in Boston, and one in San Francisco. Uh, so, you know, that's the first time. And what happened, I mean, actually, it wasn't in the plan to sell that company. I, that's not what I was hoping for. But my parent company, the guy who sent me to the US, at some point was finding himself in a predicament. At that time in Europe, a small company called Unilever had decided uh, that they would become the king of industrial baking in Europe. And they started acquiring left and right 
companies. And my boss at the time saw himself in a situation where he would be engaged in a price war with a company that was, of course, infinitely larger than he was. Unilever, you know, I mean, you all know what Unilever is. Uh, so he wanted to have cash, uh, you know, a treasure chest uh, that would uh, enable him to go into a price war or to face whatever situation he would face. So at that time, he told me, Frederick, I mean, do you think we could sell that business? Because I need money. And uh, certainly we had a very nice ride going from, you know, two to 45 million in four years. So that sounded like a business that could be attractive to a buyer, uh, especially as we had, at the time, we were the leader uh, for our segment, for our market segment in the bakery business. It was making partially baked bread. That was at the time the new, new thing, you know, uh, very convenient for food service operators. You want to, you have a restaurant, you want to have great bread, serve great bread, but well, you don't want to have a baker on, uh, on your payroll. So you're basically buying a frozen, partially baked product that you're going to finish off in your oven at the restaurant and you're serving a warm, loaf of bread to your customer exactly as if you had made it yourself and that's what we were doing and the concept really worked well and it worked well for cruise lines I mean you know sensing if you think of it on a cruise ship uh, you cannot have an army actually there is an army but I mean you cannot have you want to limit the number of staff and augment the number of paying passengers. And to do that, you disembark staff and you load on more paying passengers. So to do that, you basically get rid of your baking staff and replace it with partially baked bread. So that's, mm. what, that's what made the success of this product, essentially. And at the time, it was innovative. Uh, so going back to what we are talking about, uh, selling the company. How do you sell a company that's coming out of the blue? We are experiencing a great ride. You know, we are looking at 60, 70 million dollars of sales down the road a couple of years after. We were the leaders on our market segment. So what do you do? And either you go to an investment banker or something like that, and you tell them, I want to sell the company. Here are the books. Uh, what can you do? Well, but even oh. before that, where, where, where do you start determining the right time to sell? What even leads to the decision for the sale? Well, in, in that case, again, I mean, as I explained, I mean, that wasn't my decision. That was a decision of the ownership of the company. They didn't need money and they saw something that was successful and they told themselves, well, you know, it's not an essential part of our business. They were mostly European. The American division was just a small asset. So it was so, a strategic decision. Was there other sales that you were involved or was it for this no, one? No, 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 there were others. There were others after that. I mean, uh, another one, uh, and, uh, it's down the road, but after, after that company was sold and after I left that group, I worked for a company called Promise Land Dairy in Texas. And, and, you know, that company, basically my job was a turnaround job on, uh, on preparing the company for sale. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, transform it from a money losing business to something that was attractive and that could be scaled up because that's at the end of the day what an, an investor or buyer wants to buy, something that can be scaled up. Uh, you know, if, if the, the, the most, most large company or investor don't want to buy something for what it is today, they want to buy it for what it can be tomorrow. Uh, and so, I mean, my job was basically, I mean, to make it more palatable uh, to an outside company and ultimately that business was sold to Borden and uh, on Borden a uh, couple of years after or a year after found himself sold to Grupo Lala uh, from Mexico. Uh, but so that was a second time uh, in between still on Biral for that Mr. Neuhauser. Uh, after we had sold that company in Boston, uh, he left me a little bit of money in the States and told me, well, I mean, make another one, make another company. So he left me a, a few millions, I mean, to build up a new company. And we build up again a new company uh, that was manufacturing bagels. Uh, bagels at the time were all the rage. I mean, everybody wanted to have a bagel. And so we did a company called Uptown Bagels. And that was a wholesale manufacturer, uh, mostly for the food service industry. 
And same thing after a while. I mean, that company had to be sold. I mean, for the same good reason, we want money. Uh, well, so you, that, but you built that one up from scratch and then sold yeah, it. So yeah, you, yeah. you built a business yeah. line up within yeah. a company and yeah. then sold that business line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we started from absolutely zero. I mean, I remember fondly uh, seeking out space to build a plant. And literally, we started from a, a cow pasture. Uh, in the southern part of New Jersey to a plant. I mean, and uh, and to uh, later, uh, the provider of all baked goods for uh, a chain of convenience store and and a gas station called Wawa. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but very successful company. Uh, Incredible company, by the way. Uh, Very, very smart people uh, leading it in a very difficult environment. But anyway, we are manufacturing all the baked goods that you were buying at Wawa. Uh, We had, you know, uh, it was backbreaking, by the way. I mean, you know, you're doing a fresh product every day. You're doing 50 different SKUs every day. And every day they have to leave on time in 50 different trucks that are going to run from New, from New Jersey all the way down to at the time South Carolina. And that's every day, 365 or 64 days a year because they don't even close for Christmas. Uh, so anyway, that was a very, very interesting business. Uh, but that company ultimately was sold uh, to a neighboring company, also publicly traded, called uh, G&J Snack Food. G&J snack food. I mean, they are the king of pretzels. Uh, all the frozen pretzels you see in, you know, sports arena or in supermarket in boxes are coming from those guys, G&J snack foods. Uh, also, family-owned company, remarkable business. Uh, so, so it yeah. sounds like there's a clear strategic driver when it's time to make that decision to sell. Yes and no. I mean, you know, most of the time it's driven by circumstances. Uh, And, and, you know, the ownership of the business is going to have a specific need. Uh, And at that time they will say, well, it's a good time to sell. And this is basically it most of the time. Or, or, Or a larger company decides that that specific company they want to sell no longer fits in their portfolio is a distraction. Uh, Promise Land Dairy and the guy who owns Promise Land Dairy is a guy who uh, is a guy who owns KCI medical medical supplies. Uh, so he's a doctor. I mean, he made a dairy because he's a very devout person, and one day he had a vision that he should make a a dairy and he decided to build a dairy uh, he had the money to do it but you know after 10 years i mean he decided that maybe it wasn't all that and that wasn't really fitting so well with uh, his portfolio and he wanted to unload it to sell it and so no i mean you know it's all my experience most of the time it's it hasn't been a conscious decision where you know you have a bunch of people gathering around the table and saying, "Well, you know, this is the best time to do it." No, it's been driven honestly, mostly by circumstances and uh, and uh, bigger people, richer people, uh, deciding that it no longer fits their needs or wants, and they decide to move on. So it sounds like there's a few different scenarios you can have. The conclusion, hey, this is the right time to sell, and then you plan it. Got you have uh, maybe an offer you can't refuse, and then you gotta think that through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you have the other situation you don't want to be in, which is you have to sell. Yeah, you have to sell, but you know the offer you can refuse. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, sure. when you are a software company, where you are in a, f- a pharmaceutical company, and you discover something that is a game changer. Uh, sure, you're going to have bigger people who want to buy what you have. But where you are in the food industry, how often do you see a product that is truly changing the landscape? I mean, something that is completely changing the way people consume food and, and to the point where a larger company will say, oh my God, I mean, how could we miss this? And we absolutely need to do this. And we couldn't make it ourselves. And think of it. I mean, recently, I mean, there is, of course, the plant-based 
movement. And there's a couple of companies that did wonderful with that. I mean, snacks, I mean, the company I used to work for within Superfood, or uh, people like Impossible Burger, and, you know, people who basically created uh, something that looked and bled like a burger with plants. And, but that, that's a game changer. But most of the time, this is not the situation you're in. You are just finding a slightly better mousetrap uh, a slightly better product. And what you have to sell is the opportunity for a larger person to multiply the product in more places or in a different segment that you haven't been able to enter, but they're already in that segment. For example, if you're a food service person, well, you haven't been able to penetrate the supermarket industry and you tell yourself, well, that product would work in a supermarket too, uh, but it takes millions, I mean, to launch a new product in a supermarket or in the supermarket trade. So, uh, you know, we already have the network, the contact, the brokers, the sales force and everything. So for us, it's just going to be an addition. So we decide, yeah, that, that fits our need. Uh, and, and, you know, there's... So if you are in that situation, what are you really selling? You are selling an indication to a larger company or an investor that you're capable of generating very rapid growth. And I would say at that point, you rebid down and all of that. Of course, it's important, but this is not the, mo the most important point. I mean, the most important point is your ability to grow and how will they multiply that and make it even grow faster. And, and those large companies are going to assume that because they integrate that into their system, they are not going to experience a whole lot more cost and it's just going to be additional sales mostly and it's going to drop mostly to the bottom line. That's, that's a reasoning uh, that I think. Uh, most of the large companies in the food industry are using. Uh, if you are, as a food company, trying to basically sell profitability, well, it's, it's rare. You know, I mean, food companies are not known to generate 25% of EBITDA uh, every year. I mean, that's just not the reality. Uh, you're doing 10, 12%, you're doing great. And, and that's few and far between, I mean, doing that. Uh, so, you know, if you're approaching uh, a group of investors or, or, or a larger company and your valuation is going to be based on EBITDA or multiples of EBITDA, you're not in a great place. Uh, you know, if you're a profitable company, you're doing, here you are, as a mid-sized small company, you're doing 8, 10% of EBITDA. Uh, okay, say you're doing $40 million of sales, $4 million of EBITDA a year, and they offer you five or five or six times EBITDA, $24 million. Sure, it's great. I mean, if you want the company, but, you know, it's not the windfall that many people picture. Uh, so I think, and I have seen, I have experience and I have seen around me, most of the time the best sales are companies that have been able to grow very, very fast are in one sector of the industry and, and they're basically selling the concept that this could be multiplied in other sectors of the food arena. Um, like I said, supermarket to food service or vice versa. And, and that you are in some instances a regional company and a larger guy is going to take it nationwide and if you are doing on a regional basis or in a quarter of the USA, if you're doing 25 million, the larger company is going to say, well, you know, we have the network. We're just going to take it to everywhere in the US. And here you are. You have a hundred million dollar division. And that does interest them uh, because they have a success story to sell everywhere else. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how you're shaping the your drafting the investment thesis for a potential buyer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now how, how do you go to market with that? Do you go out and you have some relationships, maybe you don't, and you're reaching out to these companies or do you recruit an investment bank to do this for you? Well, What's that look like? You know, investment bankers, you're not going to interest them until you reach a certain size. 
because the way they're going to look at it is they're going to say, tell you what, I mean, if I'm trying to sell a $10 million company or a $50 or $75 million company, this is the same amount of work for me. But my fees, since they're generated mostly on a percentage, that's not going to be that great. So I'd rather focus my time on selling a $50 to $100 million company than selling a bunch of $10 million companies. So it's, it's hard, I mean, to interest you know, the VC scene until you reach a, a critical size uh, or an investment banker and, 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 and until you reach a critical size. And here again, if you're trying to sell uh, your profitability, well, if you've been experiences, if you have been experiencing rapid growth, uh, it takes money. And most of the time that company that has gone from one to $50 million in five years, uh, their bottom line is not going to be that great. I mean, again, we're in food. I mean, we are not in doing a pharmaceutical product where margins are incredible. And, you know, I mean, when you make food, I mean, this is the same basis all the time. You're trying to have your cost of goods plus labor to be at or below 50%. And if you're doing that, you're doing great. Uh, but, you know, I don't know of any food company that has... Uh, uh, a cost of goods sold plus labor, that's 10% and 90% is, is profit or gross margin. I mean, that just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, profitability is not as easy to generate uh, and, and to be attractive for an outside investor. Uh, so and, and dep depending on the size, you, you dictate how much of the process you're going to be very hands-on versus working with an advisor. Correct. Um, I feel like the real art of doing the M&A deal is what you described of drafting this investment thesis, then talking to these companies that would be your potential acquirers. Well, you're correct. And, and actually, uh, I find it best if you're not talking to them, uh, because it's always better to be courted than to be the person trying to court some, some, someone. Uh, how, how do you structure that? If you if you have an idea, here's this identified a potential buyer. You started drafting that investment thesis for them, and you, but you you want, obviously want them to take lead to ask you out, as opposed to you knocking on their door yep. saying, "Hey, I got to sell this," because you you want you want to have the right balance of um, yep. Yep. the power. Well, yeah, no, you are uh, you're absolutely right, and you know if. If there is one thing that I certainly have learned is, first of all, if you're trying to sell, don't talk to only one company or one person. I mean, if you're pursuing only one deal at a time, you have no leverage. Uh, you're not ready to go up of your chair and leave the room, uh, which you have to be willing and able to do. Uh, so at a minimum, pursue it with two potential acquirers. If you don't have that, well, you—it's going to be rough. <laughs> it's going to be—it's going to be very rough. Uh, let me, you know, and it's old enough that I can—I can use names here. But let me give you an example. When I started uh, trying to sell that company called Rudy's, uh, the one that was making par baked bread in Boston, when I started selling that, I first went the route of you know business brokers and everything. And one of those guys hooked me up with Sarah Lee. At the time, Sarah Lee was really big in Becky. And uh, so he approached them. Uh, they approached me. Uh, they asked me to come to the headquarters in Chicago. Uh, they sent me a beautiful car to pick me up at the airport. I had a beautiful room, very impressive and everything. I met a whole lot of people who basically started telling me, ah, you know, your company is not really profitable. It's only, maybe we could offer you two times MBA, uh, EBITDA, uh, maybe three times if you push it, but more likely, more likely, than, more likely two times EBITDA, I mean, which was absolutely not what we were looking for. And, and uh, no interest in selling the company uh, at that level. So I realized that and I told myself, that's not going to work. Uh, so the other approach I took was to basically use the professional leverage, the power of professional press. And, and I reached out to a couple of professional magazines and told them, hey, look, uh, we have a wonderful story here. 
uh, we started from very little. We grew like wildfire. Uh, and, and, you know, the professional press is always seeking this type of stories. I mean, that's what makes the magazines interesting. Uh, so I had a couple of those magazines reaching out, doing full features. Uh, I was lucky because luck is also an important part always for anything in life. Uh, but I was lucky to have, uh, you know, at the time of the NRA show, I mean, not the National Rifle Association, but the National Restaurant Association uh, <laughs> in Chicago, uh, so which is a, a major show for food service every year. Uh, and here you go. I mean, the magazine that they were distributing at the door had my company on the front page uh, with a beautiful picture of the bread we were doing. And the whole article was about how great a success we had been and how fast we grew and so forth and so on. So on the heels of that, what happened is I started getting calls. I, I, I wasn't the one calling anymore. People were calling. And, and you know, uh, actually we had like four companies, I mean, four different companies in addition to Sarali calling us. Uh, so we, st we decided after a little while to work more specifically with one of them uh, called Pillsbury. And, uh, you know, conversation went on and went on with, with Pillsbury. And when Sarah Lee got wind of it and, and heard that we were actually in, in advanced talk with, with Pillsbury, I don't know what happened at their headquarters, but basically the m and people probably got a scolding. I mean, how could you let this happen, blah, blah, blah. I get another call from Sarah Lee and tell him, yeah, I forget, I mean, the two or three times EBITDA, I mean, now we're talking in multiples of sales. And remember, the wow. company was doing 45 million. So we want from them offering us less than 10 million to over 45 million in the span of two months and for no good reason. I mean, you know, there wasn't any financial reason, but the fact that now all of a sudden there were multiple people interested in the deal and for the fact that I guess they had a fear of missing out. Uh, you know, it was, it was, again, like I said, in the food industry, not, not, not very often do you see new and appealing thing happening. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, when you see a corner of the industry where someone is finding something that's growing from nothing to 50 million in four years, and the big companies are saying, wow, I mean, okay, we missed out. And, you know, this is the story of the Greek yogurt. Uh, you know, uh, how all the people who were king of yogurt in the U.S. missed out. And some guy, I mean, who purchased a broken down plant in New Jersey, turned it into a billion dollar business. Uh, but if you can generate, you know, market interest like that, the big company and realize that they missed out and all of a sudden, the price is not really the issue anymore. And, and honestly, I even got in a situation where we were on the verge of signing with Spilsbury, uh, some very high up at Sarali called up, uh, called up and said, whatever they offer you, we offer 5 million more. Where is that coming wow. from? I mean, you know, it's not, I mean, and, and the, he didn't even know what we were being offered. And it was just, well, whatever, whatever, 5 million more. And now the owner of the company had some ethics and said, no, I'm not, you know, thank you, but no thanks. I mean, you know, if I'm, if I'm in an advanced deal with people, I'm just not going to walk away uh, because I'm getting offered more money. Uh, so that did not happen. And we sold to Pillsbury ultimately. Uh, but it's a very interesting situation. And, and, you know, if I compare that with the same ownership and the situation we were when we tried to sell Upton Bagel, where we were not able to generate that multiple interest to the completely different ambience, I guarantee you. I mean, the guy on the other side of the table had all the leverage. Uh, so. Frederick, in uh, the software world, we call that demand generation, what you described. Yep. Uh, and I, I like that approach a lot. Are there any other approaches where you're either doing something similar or maybe you had to find a, a way just to get in front of them directly and, and pitch the story. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, and then, uh, then when you, when you're in a long time in an industry, you end up knowing a lot of people. 
uh, or if you don't, I mean, you shouldn't be in that industry anymore. But I mean, you know, just you spread out the world. Again, I mean, I, I, I'm not a big fan at all of knocking on doors uh, because it, you, if you send the message that you're in need and you're trying to sell, it's not the best position to be in. So uh, be patient, uh, have the guts to wait, and maybe it will take longer than you want. But spread the word out, and at some point, if you repeat it enough, maybe even in podcasts like yours. I mean, you know, I'm, I have no, you know, Bolloré has no interest whatsoever in selling anything here. But but you know, that would be the perfect example because your podcast is listened to by people in the M and N arena. So I could sleep right there and there. Hey, you know, and hey. I got the message around and maybe I get a couple of phone calls after that. But, but you're not going out with the message that you are for sale. It sounds like you're focused on the growth and the, the attractive parts and getting more or you, less exposure. Well, I mean, you do both. I mean, you know, okay. you, you, you indicate, you indicate that there is a consideration and you, you're asking yourself, you know, sometimes playing, being, playing, as if you're not knowledgeable, as if you're inexperienced, is a good way of proceeding too. You know, if you send the message, I mean, ah, you know, I'm really torn. I don't know what I want to do, even if you know what you want to do, but I'm really torn. I don't know, uh, what do you think? And, and people like to talk. I mean, that's just a fact. And, and, and your hesitation or, or, or maybe your fake hesitation <laughs> will, will be repeated. And at some point, you're going to land into the right person's ear. Yeah, and it's almost a way you can explore it, even ask for advice or get different opinions. But that could yeah, be more yeah, of a... Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, it, you, it, it, depending upon who you're talking to, it can take different form. I mean, can you help me? Uh, explain to me uh, what should I do? All those things. And, and you're going to get the world around. But in the food industry, I mean, taking a list of VCs, and, and just going down the list and sending your paper to 150 VCs and hoping that some of them will bite is hard. I mean, again, uh, unless you have something that has some spectacular growth and you can sell a dream more than an achievement, which often works. You know, sometimes selling a potential is easier to sell than a reality. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, that's life. Uh, and, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely harm yourself with patience and, and, and just be ready for the process, the initial process, the initial contact, I mean, to last six months, a year, 18 months. I mean, that's what you have to be ready for. It's not because all of a bright morning, you get out of bed and you decide, okay, now is the time to do it. I, I want money in my pocket and I'm going to go out and sell. And I'm just going to send papers to a hundred people and I'm going to have 50 people banging on my door. <laughs> Not really seen that very often. What are the steps you need to take to prepare for an acquisition on the sell side? Well, first of all, I mean, when you're going to, you know, you have to realize that you still have a business to lead. Okay, and you still have customers to visit and food show to attend and problem to deal with and people quitting on you and so forth and so on. So normal life of your, the normal life of your company will not stop because you've decided to sell. So that means that on the preparation side, if you are starting the, sell, the selling process and you haven't built up everything that will be asked of you in the due diligence process, you're setting yourself up for a very, very hard situation because you're going to be torn between the daily need of the business and it's going to be even more pressure because if you have an accident, the loss of a major customer, all of a sudden, it's going to freak out, spook the potential buyers. I mean, uh, you know, oh, I just lost whole food. Oh my God. And I just lost whole food because I, I, I took my eyes off the ball. I wasn't attentive enough and I let some logistics issue, a lot, some operational issue create a problem for me. So 
prepare. I mean, prepare, I mean, meaning everything that you will be asked in due diligence. And, and due diligence are infernal. I mean, they are so exhausting, so detailed. So every little bit of agreement, paper, lease, Uh, buying agreement, selling agreement, whatever you have is going to be examined. So you literally have to start building folders on your computer and, you know, making a, a due diligence folder. And at the end of the process, that thing will be 15 folder long and probably tens of thousands of pages. I mean, that's a reality. I mean, your, your whole company life since inception will have to be in that folder. Uh, so only takes time because when you're growing a company fast uh, and most, most of the time you don't have a huge structure around you. So uh, you, you have to prepare for that. I mean, you know, and, and, and there is nothing worse than if you're being asked for documentation and you don't have it and you just have to say to someone, well, we don't have that. I mean, we'll get back to you in two weeks. I mean, after we do it. And the other side is going to look at that as unprofessional and prepared. Uh, oh, does that mean that company doesn't have clean records? I, you're, you're opening basically uh, Pandora's box for yourself because that type of, of, of delaying or that type of situation where we are saying, uh, you know, I don't have it, I'm not ready, just indicates that you, you're not great at record keeping. Uh, that your books are not in order. Uh, if you're being asked for a margin analysis, I mean, tell me, tell me what is your margin per customer and per segment, and you don't have that uh, available. Well, immediately, also you're, you're you're driving the business blind. Is that what you do? I mean, so you know, you're, you're opening a whole bunch of questions that are going to affect your credibility and attractiveness. So most definitely, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, you want to have Um, your due diligence uh, ready. Uh, the second thing, if you really want to sell, I would say have multiple new product development and launches in your program available. Because again, I mean, people will pay more for something that could happen than something that has happened because something that could happen, you could present it in a very favorable light. Something that has happened, it's just a hard number. It is or it isn't. Uh, so, you know, if you say, well, sure, I mean, we're incredibly successful with those 10 products, but guess what? I mean, because we know so well, I mean, we've developed, I mean, five more products that we're about to launch in the next six months or eight months. All of a sudden, those people are saying, hmm, you know, I mean, don't launch them just now. I mean, let us do it because we'll do it better than you. Because, of course, I mean, the acquiring side is always working from the idea that they know more, or they will do better than you, or if they wouldn't buy you. Uh, and so, have uh, you know your next, your new product development for the next 18 months ready? Because that's at the end of the day what will will make the difference in your attractiveness. If you don't have much or if you have nothing and people will say, well, what am I really buying here? I mean, what am I buying that I couldn't do myself? Uh, so, uh, you know, it's great. Uh, and you can even engineer that. Uh, you know, you can be in, in, in the testing phase of, of a new product, uh, but you, you restrain it to the channel where you know it's going to shine the best so that you can provide wonderful numbers. And, you know, in, in, in the food industry, if you're selling to the supermarket trade, velocity is everything. Uh, because, you know, how, how, many, how, many S, how many units of one SKU will you move per week, per store? Uh, since shelf space is limited, the only multiplication you can do is how fast you sell it. Uh, so, You know, if you if you know you have a, a product that can be great, but you don't really know because you haven't sold it yet to 5,000 supermarkets and, and you don't have actual results, 
pick up one or two. I mean, the one you know where it's going to shine the best and you can show to a potential buyer, look at that. I mean, you know, I have this new product in testing phase, in testing mode, and we are doing twice the velocity of any competitor in the similar arena. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, you're, wow, okay, they really have something going on here and we better jump on it. Uh, so definitely have new product uh, ready, uh, ready for, um, for launch. Uh, have your team ready. And what I mean by team is not necessarily um, an investment banker, but if you're going to sell a company, you need to have a really good tax attorney available. Uh, you know, tax are complicated matters. Uh, the buyer, most of the time, is a lot more knowledgeable and a lot more astute than you are on taxes. And they will want the deal to work um, to their advantage on the most basic level. Um, you know, is it a cash for asset sale or are you selling the actual company? Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, the way you will get paid and, and how fast and this and that. I mean, all those questions that, uh, that, you know, that will make your tax bill either negligible or a major part of your proceeds is something you need to contemplate upfront. I mean, so that you know what you want. And, and if, you let the, if you let the buyer guide you, you're always going to be in a defensive position where you have to push back and push back. If you, at the first contact, I mean, state very clearly, well, the only thing that doesn't trust me is a cash for asset sell, for example. Uh, well, at least the guy, you know, will not try to argue that. Maybe he will, but you made your statement. Uh, and, and they know what will and won't work. So have a clear idea of what type of deal structure uh, you want. I mean, you know, uh, from a tax standpoint, and, and, and from, um, from a future standpoint, I mean, also decide where you want to be. I mean, do you want to be part of the future company? Do you want to have a transition role? Do you want to just take the money, run, and start something else? Uh, you have to decide that from the get-go, I mean, before you talk to people. I and mean, there's nothing worse than, again, uh, lack of clarity or indecision. Internally, your people, uh, what is your situation? Uh, are you in a situation where your people have a strong vested interest in you selling the company, meaning that there is some sort of windfall for them? Or are you the sole benefactor of, that, of the sale? That's a very different situation. Uh, because, you know, in one situation, everyone will be pushing. And the other situation, you will have a choice between either fighting everyone or even being in a situation where you're hostage uh, to your senior management, uh, where they say, well, if that happens, I'm going. But then the acquirer say, well, if you have the VP of sales and if you have the VP marketing and if you have the plant manager leaving, what am I buying here? <laughs> you know, a book of recipes. Uh, so that's not, that's not great. Uh, so decide that, um, decide that beforehand or, or know exactly in what situation you are. Also contemplate if you are going to have outside actors uh, having leverage on the deal. And what I'm, I have in mind here is, for example, if you're leasing property, if you're leasing your plant, if you're leasing a building, um, you know, more, more, there is a very high probability your lease won't be transferable. So if you are in a situation, and I have been there, uh, where basically your lesser uh, is telling you no, not going to, uh, uh, to sign an assignment of the lease, well, maybe unless you, you accept a 30% rent increase and the lease goes from three years remaining to seven years remaining. And the guy is literally holding you hostage. Uh, and the whole deal is going to hinge on that. So contemplate all of that and ask yourself the question, do, is there any outside actor that can hold me uh, hostage uh, and basically hold the deal up and ransom me? Uh, yeah. Do you have any dirty laundry? 
Uh, meaning, is there anything? Do you have any lawsuit pending, threatened? Uh, because they will come out during due diligence. Or, or if, you're, if you're good enough to hide them, they will come back to haunt you. Uh, because, you know, you, you at, in some form, you will have a representation and warranty uh, part of the deal. And if you misrepresented, you're going to end up in court and giving back a lot of what you made. <laughs> So all of those things, you know, they are hard truths. And, and, and when you have that, you created something, it's working well. Uh, you're in love with it. Uh, you're part of it. It's very hard to contemplate all the negative aspects. Uh, who can hurt you? We can hold you. We can ransom you. But this is something you have to do. And this is where an outside counsel can be most helpful because that guy is not going to have the same vision of the business as you do. And he's going to look at the hard fact. And he's going to, you know, so work with an experience, uh, an experience acquisition attorney. And yeah, you're going to spend multiple six figures or possibly more, but this is money that is very well spent. And if you know you can't afford that money, then you probably shouldn't sell in the first place because it means that you're weak. Uh, you're not going to be able to sustain the time that the acquisition may take. Some acquisition go quick. Uh, you know, that sales of hoodies, I mean, everything happened in the course of three months, and that was including due diligence. Uh, some acquisition take forever. Uh, you know, company I recently worked for, 18 months after, nothing still had happened, and probably nothing will happen. Uh, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting for everyone, for the morale, for... So uh, just it's just be prepared on, on like most things in life. I mean, look at the glass half empty instead of looking at it as half full and, and be prepared for the worst or for the best, but be prepared for the worst. All right, so I got four key areas is what I'm picking up that you need to do to pick up to prepare to sell your business. One, understand and prepare for buyer's diligence really getting a sense is what's that process as they go through assess the risk understand where your dirty laundry is and be pre prepared ahead of time mm -hmm. uh second one is uh building that narrative of the future potential of your company yep that you really think through like what, what does that look like so you can flush that out and build more on the future potential as opposed to what your current past track record is. The third is the team. And it sounds like there's both internal team and external team. Yep. Uh, maybe you don't have this big M&A capability. So think of the tax attorney, M&A attorney that you're going to work with externally. And then internally, who are the key people that are going to help you build, manage this process as well? Because uh, obviously there's going to be a lot of effort that goes into it. And we'll expand on that a little bit. But the fourth one was the vision and goals to really have clarity on, are you going to stick around? Are you planning to move out? Do you, do what kind of, how would you like to participate post close? And uh, it sounds like those are the four key areas. Did, did I get that right? Yep. No, you got that exactly right. Absolutely. Absolutely. With the internal part, I mean, your own people. Uh, yeah. Who, um, who is, who are the internal people? Because I, I can see here, CFO, obviously want to keep in the loop about what we're doing here. But how transparent are you about this? And, and you know, does this something you socialize across all your functional leads or is it very much as an as need to know basis? I think it really depends on, on the situation. Again, if, if, if you had a management style where all the key employees have a vested interest, uh, you know, because most of the time, I mean, most of the people won't lose their job, at least not immediately, at least for not, not for a couple of years. Uh, but if they know that at the end of the sale, they're going to get a bonus, quote unquote, uh, that equals, let's say, no less than six months of their paycheck. I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, they see something bright and shiny ahead that's going to make them participant as opposed to uh, enemies uh, of the deal. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard, I mean, to do it uh, in a concealed manner. I mean, and, and 
when we saw that again that all this company and i'm always going back to this one because this one is old and um, you know there is no trailing confidentiality agreement, uh, confidentiality agreements and so forth uh, but we did it in a in a way where we are very very few people just like you said outside of the cfo i mean no one was knowing so uh, the due diligence all occurred under the guise of customer audits and 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 different types of audits but it's hard i mean to maintain uh, to maintain the fable i mean to maintain the story and to make people believe that why because a food auditor doesn't look like a corporate I mean, a guy, the, you know, I mean, when you get, when you see a guy walking through the door in a, with a suit on a, a briefcase, uh, chances are he's not a food auditor. Chances are he's not a food inspector. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people, and, and if your own people feel that you're misleading them, I mean, this is when you start hemorrhaging people. This is when people are leaving you. Uh, and and that's of course very not only very detrimental for the cell but for the very future of the business because if you've been successful it's not because of you it's because of the people you had around you uh, so um, no very important I'm a big fan of making sure that all the key people are incentivized in some way you don't want to give stock fine I mean there is other ways to do that. And, you know, phantom stocks and uh, you know, all kind of different instruments. And people are, most people, 99% of the people are not going to finesse and saying, oh, well, yeah, but if you had given me stocks, my tax bill is going to be lower, blah, blah. No, I, you know, most people won't go to that level of, of, of dissection. Uh, they are going to just say, well, you know, I, I appreciate, I mean, what you're doing. And at the end of this transaction, I'm going to keep my job. And I'm going to get a bonus uh, that's going to be, like I said, six months to a year worth of my pay. Uh, that's nice. Thank you. And, uh, and, you know, and they will be happy with that. And, and all of a sudden, I mean, they will help you uh, making that sale happen. And, and you could, again, if you try to do it just you on your CFO in the, in the frame, again, of a small to mid-sized company, that also means that all the work is hinging on you. I mean, you cannot delegate anything. You cannot ask for anything to build or to hunt or to, 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 to retrieve the simplest document. Because if you keep asking, I don't know, if you keep the HR person uh, for the history of workers' comp accident and then this and then that, and you know, after the third request, that person is going to come to you and say, what's going on? <laughs> and so, and, 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 and if people figure that you're lying to them, you're losing a loyalty, you're losing uh, enthusiasm, you're losing a lot of things. And let's keep in mind that more than often the sale will not go through. Uh, you know, there is a lot more unsuccessful sales and they are successful ones. Uh, so if you destroy your team in the process, uh, you're not in a great place after. Patrick, I'm enjoying this conversation. We're going to have to schedule time to sure. continue this conversation. Um, we'll do that. But before I let you go, what's the craziest thing you've seen in M&A? Uh, tantrums. I mean, tantrums. I mean, literally, I mean, tantrums. And, and you know, a room full, full of people, corporate attorneys, house councils and everything. Everyone screaming at one another, throwing paper through the room. Uh, really? Oh, yeah. No, I have seen that. I, I, I have seen that. I mean, What's like an example well, of something that well, would spark a, a good nah, tantrum? No, 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 no. Because, you know, people who are still in, in business are involved there. Oh, so uh, it's definitely something very specific. But, but hey, I mean, I remember, well, actually, I mean, uh, that poor individual, I mean, he's no longer with us. I mean, so uh, Mr. Neuhauser, the guy who owned that company, Rudy Foods, wanted that the transaction to go faster because he wanted to spend uh, the weekend with one of his girlfriend and and the MA attorneys uh, on the other side of the table were not really up for that uh, let's just say the guy had a very crude way of speaking and was using a lot of language that wouldn't work so well in your times 
but at the time it wasn't working well already because it was really incredibly crude and offensive. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there were ladies in the room and Tamper started flaring up and basically, I mean, a whole stack of paper, I mean, flew through the room and in his face. Wow. <laughs> wow. Did the deal get done? Uh, the deal got done. The deal got done because, you know, one of the guys uh, made a really simple question at the end of the day and he looked at him and told him, you want the money or not? <laughs> and that's basically when he sat down and shut up. Take it to the bottom line. Yep, exactly right. <laughs> Frederick, I'm going to look forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, to to give you a heads up, I, I do. I'm, I'm going to ask you about some some French M and A terms because I'm I'm curious if there's some different language that you oh, use okay. referring to M and A. Uh, so we'll have some fun with that. But I'll look forward to having that conversation with you again soon. Absolutely, I look forward to it. Till then, here's to the deal. Thank you, thank you, and have a great day.